and we are live. Okay, welcome everybody that is viewing in. This is our live stream with Kathy Sedeo. Super excited, have not yet to get to uh, meet her in person or talk in depth. So this is gonna be a fun one. We're both on this journey together, um, learning here. She's talking at our upcoming conference, um, talking about improving your Q, IQ, Q. I like this. Um, so of course, we have a bunch of sponsors helping make this happen. Uh, Central Reach, as well as Terra Nova is our platinum sponsor. Thank you to everyone. We'll talk about the conference a little bit at the end. And without further ado, Kathy, good morning. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Good afternoon, Ryan. Nice Fantastic. to see you. Fantastic. I love the energy that you bring to a conversation. This is going like to be a blast. I like talking about this <laughs> Lucky to do it. Yeah. Thanks so um, let's set a little bit of context. I have a couple questions in the hopper. But um, first of all, uh, what's your story? How'd you get in this line of work? Can you share some of that? <laughs> <laughs> I made the mistake of taking an elective course in animal behavior as an undergraduate pre-med student in college. And I thought, eh, sounds like an easy course to take to fulfill my, you know, psych elective. And yeah, uh, yeah changed my life. So my professor, uh, Dr. Pat Ebert, astonishing woman. I never even knew there was a field of animal behavior. This would have been in 1980 one, maybe even earlier than that. My gosh, before you were born. Um, anyway, changed my <laughs> life in that I uh, fell in love with what she was teaching um, and she needed help doing um, an ethogram uh, research study at the local aquarium where I grew up in Niagara Falls, New York. So I said, okay. yeah, I can earn some credit watching dolphins at the aquarium and you know noting their behaviors. Don't mind doing that. No, oh, I got totally hooked. <laughs> my dad, who just turned 97, happy birthday, dad, wow, 97. congrats. He still has not gotten over the phone call where I said, I'm no longer pre-med. Oh, he <laughs> still, God love him, he doesn't so, know what I do for a living. He still asked me, how do you make a living? <laughs> so I grad, yeah, I graduated in a really small town in uh, from high school in, uh, called Tonopah, Nevada, and I went to the University of Nevada, Reno. Not sure what to do. It was actually, uh, I was not like within the pre-med, but I was like, pre-med is kind of my idea. Like, I'll explore that area because my, my mom worked there, and it was my first psych class where I called my dad up, and I was like, I, I'm kidding you not. I called my dad, and I was just like, hey, I'm done with like the medical stuff. I'm going to psychology, <laughs> and he was like, what can you do with that? And I was like, I'll, I'll figure it out. <laughs> And uh, still, my sister, uh, they were just in town for my brother's graduation. He's graduated with his undergraduate. Um, and they were kind of like still joking about like, I don't know what Ryan does exactly. Because um, especially with this digital nomad and being online all the time and in that sort of world, it's very different. So that's it. That's, that's awesome. Doesn't make a lot of sense. But yeah, that, <laughs> uh, that changed, changed my uh, trajectory. The other big sort of brave move for me was I had um, decided, uh, it, it's sort of in the vein of your relatives asking, what are you going to do with that degree? When yeah. I went to grad school originally, I studied organizational psychology for about two months and realized from day one, I I just hated it. I hated the subject matter. I hated the people. I, I just knew that was not my passion in life. And I dropped out, which I'd never done for anything in my life. Really? And then was fortunate enough after that huge failure, I'm totally embarrassed to see on TV a NOVA program about some incredible research being done at the University of Hawaii teaching sign language to dolphins. And I remember watching that TV show in my living room back in New York with my jaw literally dropped. I thought I was dreaming. Like, I can't believe such a thing exists on this planet. I, I'm all in. Yeah. And so long story, very short, got accepted to that grad program and moved to Hawaii to study dolphins and language comprehension, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's insane. <laughs> Such a crazy job. Um, so, okay, uh, to kick us off, this will be a little bit of a left turn. Um, Joan said that I had to ask you about your morning routine. That's something <laughs> that you, you plan in. <laughs> That's because so for me, it's um, a little after 11 o'clock in the morning on the Pacific Northwest, and I've already done – yeah, five mile walk down the big hill that I live on to the beach with my dog. I'm going to try to show him to you because he's really interested in something out the window. There's nice. We've already gone to the beach to get um, today's baggie of, and you can see my walls. Here's my other wall in my den. Each baggie has pottery shards from my beach. I've been collecting for eight years. I've got 520 bags at this point. If I could carve out some time in my schedule, I would get these bags of beautiful history and shards out of my den and into 
a museum exhibit at a local museum because yeah. I love my beachcombing. So <laughs> it's in a place that allows me to do this real passion um, for me. And uh, Smudge joins me on our scavenger hunts in the morning. So I've nice. already missed this morning. Yeah, I know. Very cool. <laughs> I know. And I think so. sometimes I want to write my next book, my second book about this. And uh, my publisher, Dogwise, says, what does that have to do with dog training? And I say, it's all observation skills, right? Yeah. So, so let's uh, let's jump in the dog training a little bit. Um, yeah. A quick call to anybody out there. If you have any questions specifically for Kathy, please throw in the comments. Joan's helping do that as well. Um, but so how do we how do we get from uh, dolphin training with the Navy to dog training? <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you the two big steps on that weird trajectory. And I don't know if this happens to you, Ryan, if you've ever done like um, career day at a school, I often go to a middle school and I just went to the local college and people are like, how do I get to do what you do? I don't even know how I do what I, I <laughs> yeah. mean, it's all serendipity, right? There's not like a great plan. We, the way. we talked with a couple of people in the last week on here live that had uh, very similar re responses to that. And um, the only thing I've yet to figure out myself on like this weird trajectory is like find something and get really good at it. Find something else you're really passionate about, right? Like get really good at it. And like it starts to sort itself out, it seems like. I, yes. I mean, to, to, it seems, seems so trite to say follow your bliss. That just seems uh, absurd. But in some way your passion will lead you where you need to go if you're honest about things. I don't know. Yeah. That sounds too I know, bad, but. Well, I mean, you need to be solving someone's uh, problem at the end of the day too, right? Like if it, if it lines those two things up, I feel like you're, that's uh, setting you off on a really good track. Um, yes. Where your passion overlaps someone's great need. There's an intersection yeah. in that Venn diagram. My <laughs> mathematician friend said, Kathy, nobody knows what a Venn diagram is anymore. I'm like, well, Google it. I like it. <laughs> So the other big changes for me were um, living in Hawaii was spectacular. Um, training dolphins for the Navy and open ocean work, amazing work, but very expensive to live in Hawaii. So there was a yeah. point in my late 20s where I had to make a decision about being poor and sort of blissful in Hawaii my whole life or maybe having some um, savings. <laughs> yeah. So when I moved to the mainland um, in 1990, simply for economic reasons. The only two jobs that were open for a dolphin trainer, talk about a niche, um, were at <laughs> Disney World in Orlando mm -hmm. and at Point Find Zoo and Aquarium in Tacoma, Washington. And if you go to those two cities back to back days, I'm sorry, everybody who lives in Orlando, but Orlando, flat, hot, Disney, big company. Um, Point of Find Zoo and Aquarium is a little beautiful gem of a zoo with the Mount Rainier in the background and commencement. But anyway, it was just no competition. So. I went to grad school in Orlando, Florida and stayed an extra year to help start a company down there. And so, no, 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 I share, I actually share, share the same exact thing. It's like, it's the, I always describe it as it's the opposite of Nevada in like the, yeah. Um, and where I live in Reno. So like, uh, we have the nice dry climate four seasons. It's just, it's flat. The third tallest structure, I think is the Harry Potter ride <laughs> out there. Like I'm used to the mountains and the big mountains and like running out there and no humidity. So yeah, it's very different. Teach their own. Uh, right. I, I get ex exactly right. I'm, yeah. Could, could have been the right choice, right? Disney could have been a great future, but for me, yeah. moving to Tacoma, Washington ended up being just this incredible, wonderful thing. So I worked at the zoo here, which is a terrific zoo and aquarium for many years. Um, but any zookeeper is listening. If you own, oh, you've done zoo work, like, like, um, it's hard. It's hard emotionally. It's hard physically. So again, I'm trying to make a decision for my future and say, can I be a zookeeper for the next 30 years? And I think I probably can't. But the other constraint for me is I can't now leave Tacoma. I love where yeah. I live. I love my church. I love my beach. I, I love my friends. And so to have the skills of a marine mammal trainer for a decade, and I don't want to move from Tacoma, um, there are no other marine mammal jobs than the zoo. <laughs> yeah. The bright idea in 1996 of opening a dog daycare, which no one had ever done in the city. They were really a new concept. And I... And another zookeeper, Marcy Miller, were naive enough to go, we train polar bears and walruses and beluga whales. We can train dogs. Yeah. Oh, my Lord. We were incredibly naive and wrong. But we sort of had a setting running a dog daycare, just the two of us. I think of Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 Hour Eyes. Okay. Yeah. We got immersed in dog behavior because we had to. So I was not skilled in training dogs or even knowing about dog behavior, but it was a crash course. Then I started teaching clicker training classes then in the late 1990s at our daycare and had the 
incredible blessing to have Karen Pryor as a personal friend and nice. other pioneers in clicker training that I, in my complete stupidity, could call and say, oh my gosh, I don't really know what to do with this class. And so <laughs> have counsel from just the best folks you could ever imagine to help get me off the ground in teaching clicker training to pet owners in that context. And it's grown in the last 23 years. Bright Spot nice. Dog Training started in 1990, not 1996. So yeah. yeah. Congrats. That's a long time you run a business like that. It's, it's awesome. It um, is. There's days I want to be a barista though, Ryan. I can't lie. <laughs> <laughs> I think the life of anybody that like or is uh, entrepreneurial in that sense, like relates to that now and then. Um, so real quick, we, we interviewed somebody for those listening, but also for your context. Um, Christy Alleygood, she works at Disney's Animal Kingdom. Um, she's going to be at the event as well. So nice. that's someone to probably definitely uh, catch up with and chat with while you're there at the event. Um, and uh, so what's your what's your day to day like? Is there I assume there's nothing super consistent, but like there. Yeah. What's it like? Can I paint a picture for the, the viewers? So uh, I really do, uh, when clients schedule an appointment, my iPhone, if I showed you the, oh, there's Smudge. If I showed yeah, you the yeah. first page of my iPhone, the, the app I use most often is the tide chart. So I'm going to schedule my appointments around low tide. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's usually a trip to the beach somewhere in there because it's my mental health. Nice. You know, for my colleagues that have been doing this for 10, 20, 30 years, I am invested in flea control, meaning F-L-E-E -E control. I don't ah. want you leaving the profession because there's so much heartache in it. It's hard work we do, all of us. And yeah. so to be able to say, you need to refuel yourself. I'm gonna set that example for my colleagues by committing to the beach refuels me. So that is usually nice. part of my day. Um, but uh, then my days are kind of split 50-50. Um, so half my revenue for my business is traveling and teaching seminars and workshops. Mm -hmm. So I usually do about one trip a month where I'm- What, what are some of the topics? Um, so it's funny, what I'm gonna be talking about at um, ChatCon. Yeah. Convergence, what are we calling it? ChatCon. ChatCon. Um, yeah, but... the, the, the dilemma for me, <laughs> Joe <laughs> knows this, um, um, less than an hour to talk about cues. Oh my gosh, I love talking <laughs> about cues. I, yeah, I can't stop talking about cues. There's so much um, depth and breadth of wisdom about what cues actually are, how they function, how we think they function, that we're wrong about, the traps we get ourselves into because we don't understand the difference between cues and commands, how to build strong cues, all of that. So that's one of my favorite workshops to teach. I love when okay. dogs attend that workshop and I don't have to be on stage just talking the whole time. We actually watch dogs Work. learning about cues in nice. practice. So that's one of my favorite topics. Um, uh, I'm I, a newer kind of area of, of teaching for me. I, I just, can I reveal this? I think I probably can. The schedule for next year's Clicker Expos has come out. Um, and I taught for all the Clicker Expos since the beginning. I think I'll be on number 39 for my Clicker nice. Expos. Nice. Wow. And it's in <laughs> Seattle. It's in my backyard in January. Yay. Nice. Okay, so I get to teach um, at Clicker Expo about um, us getting better, us humans getting better at using our skill set of positive reinforcement works and coercion is dangerous. That's a quote. Positive reinforcement works and coercion is dangerous from the amazing... I'm going to get choked up. Murray Sidman, who just, uh, yeah. so like coercion and its fallout, my favorite book, uh, one of the top three, fan. right? I, yeah, I, I hand sure. them out sometimes. I just give them to people and go here, read mm -hmm. this. So that quote, positive reinforcement works and coercion is dangerous. I'm really great at with dogs. I'm not yet great at with the dog's owners and my colleagues and my, you know, students. So that um, keeping our integrity, and having that be something that carries through even to all the difficult humans in our profession and our life, um, I need a lot more skills. And so I get to teach about that at Expo. We're even going to have a lab on it, meaning we're going to practice. We're going to practice yeah. being uh, less violent in our words. <laughs> yeah. So if anyone's wanting to dig in, we'll link the episode. I was listening to the podcast piece that you're on uh, on Unleashed, and you really dove into that quite a bit. Um, on you, those words and how hard it is to kind of step back when you're looking at a, a human, right? And that interaction with somebody as, as opposed to an animal. Um, Murray, yes, 
one of my top favorite behavior analysts ever. The work, those three books, um, Coercion is Fallout, uh, Sybil's Equivalent Story, and then his tactics work is just unbelievable. So, um, life changing. I mean, really yeah. life changing. Yeah, for sure. Um, such a great. So, okay. So that's your, so you're, you're either on the road yeah, and yeah, working. On the road, or I have a consultation practice. So okay. I'm, um, applied animal behaviorist. I have an office where I see clients in a beautiful setting on my friend's 40 acre farm. So I see I, not that many, a couple of days a week, I meet with pet owners whose dogs have serious behavior problems, typically aggression. Um, about half the clients I do an initial assessment on their dog continue to do work with me. So when I um, get off um, talking with you, I'm going to go do a follow up. Oh my gosh, I love these. Um, identical twin sisters. Um, they share a house with a golden retriever named Annie. Uh, we did the initial consultation uh, about a month and a half ago, and I'm going back to follow up because the report is Annie is very stubborn. And to me, this I love the family. I like this dog. But the answer to me is, oh my gosh, every stubborn animal I've ever met has absolutely positively been trained to be stubborn. So it's a yeah, perfectly yeah. functional behavior for Annie to just lie down and say, you can't make me, which is not entertaining to the identical twin sisters. But for me, it's going to be a great conversation we're going to have about giving yeah. Annie some other ways of yeah, saying no and what consent looks like. And so about half my business is one-on-one -on -one consultations with clients and I, I never nice. bored. I never yeah. <laughs> go, this is a cakewalk. It's always something new, right? So. I, I love the piece that you, you were talking about on the podcast about it's uh, you can reinterpret all these things, right? And you just perfectly describe it. Like the stubbornness can be totally reinterpreted as part of the learning history, et cetera. Yeah. And the thing that it took me a while to realize about stubborn animals is the animals that I've unintentionally trained to be stubborn and there are many of many species, Ryan, I'm sad to say. But yeah. beyond that, the actual cue for them to refuse um, is the cue you used to have functional. So in other words, I trained a beluga whale to absolutely not move in response to the cue jump, right? Because I give the cue, actually the cue was go to the back of her exhibit. So go to the back of the exhibit. She doesn't go, I need her to go. There's work that has to be done in her pool. There's people waiting. I then get out a couple of herring and lure her to go. I've actually just told her that this cue, which used to be functional to mean move to the other part of the exhibit, now means don't move because I'm going to pull yeah. the herring. So we've <laughs> actually put stubborn on cue, which is even more sort of amazing, the flexibility of our learners to go, well, I know what that means now. It's so yeah. frustrating for the people, but it gives us some insight in how to fix things, right? Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Um, one more call for any questions, if anybody has any out there. Um, so can we get a little taste into like where you think you're going to start with the cues? I know you only have 50 minutes. Everybody that is presenting has been uh, on us for saying you only get 50 minutes. That's it. <laughs> But you already know I talk fast, so I can squeeze a lot in like 15 minutes. You can, yeah. <laughs> uh, I've talked about cues a lot, and I've never quite done it in the way I'm hoping to do it at ChatCon, which is to actually bring a practical problem, which is if you had to teach sign language to dolphins, how are you going to do that? You've got a big uh, National Science Foundation grant. You're Dr. Lou Herman. You've got this money coming in, and your hypothesis is, I think dolphins can learn a rudimentary language. I think they can comprehend that. How are you going to design that language, that system of gestures that's going to maximize the learner's ability to do it, both because you'd like your learner to be successful, that's one criteria, but your grant money is writing on it. I mean, you would like to have a career in this field. Yeah. So the care and steps we used in developing that artificial sign language. It's not American sign language. Dolphins don't see an air very well. Imagine <laughs> evolution not designing. Yeah. So if you used American sign language, the dolphins couldn't perceive the difference. So we have to create an artificial bigger sign language. But how do you do that? What are the parameters you're using when you're designing those cues? In my work at the University of Hawaii's um, Koalo Basin Marine Mammal Lab, where this research took place, I was taught a whole set of criteria that made perfect sense. And I use them fluently there. And then when I've gone out to the real world to work with pet dogs, like all of that falls by the wayside because they're dogs and it's different. And 
it's not right. So, okay. <laughs> so I want to go from that practical problem, go, how would you do that? What would be on your mind as you're designing the cue for another noun in a Kamai's language? So if a Kamai the dolphin has 15 nouns in her language and you want to add another object into her pool, it's a surfboard. What does the gesture for surfboard look like? How are you making that decision? Um, and the ways that we did that, I think it's worth reviewing it because they're broadly applicable to the dogs I'm working with, sure. The humans I'm working with, yes. <laughs> I don't think we live like we believe the rules of operant conditioning. I don't think we live like behaviors driven by consequences. We nod and we say yes, and we draw the ABCs, and we, but we don't actually put all our eggs in the consequence basket. We tend, when stuff's really important, to talk a lot and to explain and to put our eggs in the, I want to make my instructions, my antecedents really clear. So if you come from the perspective that says, I'm going to believe 100 years of science, consequences drive behavior, I want to really put my emphasis on providing generous, meaningful, frequent, positive reinforcement. I want to be the reinforcer, not the enforcer who says, do this. You have to do this. Yeah. If that's true, and it's going to be true. My gosh, the lineup of speakers at ChatCon. Oh my gosh, Susan <laughs> Schneider's going to be there. And so exciting. And I don't have to sell that, right? They're all going to sell it. And most of the audience is already going to be on board with, yeah, yeah, what's this drive behavior? Mm -hmm. Well, then what does that mean for you when you go out to deliver cues? You know how weak cues actually are if they're not linked to reinforcers. Exactly. So how do you yeah. arrange things to make sure your cues are backed up with reinforcement a lot meaningfully so that why you're being humane to the animal? Well, that, but that your cues are strong because we have to ask animals and people to do things and we need them to have fluency and motivation to do it. Oh my yeah. gosh. We're going to have fun. You know, yeah, so much. <laughs> to bring it back into Sidman, I remember reading one of his short pieces uh, in graduate school, and it finally like linked when people are talking about it's it's uh, it's the relations between everything, right? I remember a piece of his um, that like finally made that connection for me between like the strength of the consequences, like starts to affect, and that functional altering effect of the antecedents. And I was like, this makes sense. Like, it's not the A, the B, the C, or whatever model you use, yeah. right? all the linkages between those and understanding this, the white space in between those. And that white space is where the science really is. And it's it's so hard to grasp at first. I love it. Um, it so bumps up against our culture. And it it's it's just so countercultural to be able to go, everything you do as a behavior analyst, everything I do, we keep, why do we, we, we were joking um, with Joan beforehand, we're not going to run out of business, sadly. It's, why is this, uh, Susan Friedman uses the term cultural fog. Why is the fog so thick out there about how behavior <laughs> works? Because it doesn't actually sort of reveal itself to us in a daily life. We, we're sort of weirdly reinforced by the immediate consequences of our actions. And we want to take a step back and go, wait, I bet we could do better. If we kind of understood, we could go with the science or we could go against the science. We have a choice, but I see a lot of people bucking sort of the flow of the science that will help us if we sort of know eh, the rules maybe too strong a word but yeah to shed a little light on how to make your cues powerful i don't know it's a kindness to everybody right it lets yeah us yeah go forth For and sure. do some experimenting right um we have a question from jamie lynn veraldi so Hi, does, lynn. Be does behavior really have to be perfect before adding the cue what behavior is perfect Tell me. I mean, ser no, I mean this really seriously. Like, yeah. perfect behavior, it's robots, right? I Everybody's messy. And so, uh, no, and I know what you're getting to. I'm pushing back against you a little, Jamie Lynn, but yeah. I think we've often said behavior has to be really excellent before you'd put a cue on it. But the problem for me, and I've been doing this for a long time, I feel like there's some newer sort of ideas about adding cues. But to me, a big piece of the early addition of cues, especially for animals, is the part of it that says your behavior actually won't work off cue. So there's an extinction piece of it. Do we mm -hmm. like animals to be in an extinction contingency? No, it's really frustrating and it's not really easy on them. Do we never ever give animals an extinction contingency, meaning something that used to work for you and produce reinforcement no longer does? 
No, we do it with care and a little bit at a time. So for many animals, we start by building a strong behavior. And then we say, that behavior that always got you reinforcement, dog, every time you bow, I'm going to say yes and throw you a cookie because I really would like to get this trick in. So you just have to bow. I'm going to notice it. I'm going to capture that and give you reinforcement. At some point, I'm going to actually say to the dog, you know what? I'm not going to actually click and treat you when you bow unless I've said ta-da. Only going to work when the green light's here. Let's start paying attention to green lights. That's the cue. Yeah. If we waited for the behavior to be perfect, it's going to be a huge extinction burst when you now say, only when I give the cue. So I don't really want the behavior to be too perfect because it sets my learner up to really have a tough time in having that experience of you actually have to wait for the cue, stimulus control, for me to reinforce that. So the more sort of reinforcement I put into perfecting the behavior before adding the cue, the tougher that's going to be, especially in the early stages of learning for an animal. So yeah, it looks pretty good. That's what I'm going to say. It looks pretty good. Dig. Thank you. Um, okay, cool. So yeah, if we got some comments in there. Sweet. Um, Hi, I think that's, Linda. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, lots of people saying hello. So I think that's all that I have for you. Do you have any um, like final words of wisdom or anything to... <laughs> that you want to keep championing out there oh my gosh you're giving me an open mic um i know <laughs> uh no i i think um i'm lauding both you and joan for um bringing two populations together i went last year and it was fantastic but it was also kind of like oh these are people that are usually in the same room together <laughs> yeah. so i felt like it was really brave and pioneering of you guys to thank get you us talking because we don't enough <laughs> you know you know one thing that I, I always thought was uh i don't know i was taught that they're all the same like we all came from the same like you know research whatever so when we were we were talking about calling it convergence i was like isn't it kind of already like there but like uh it's working and like the community i agree has been fantastic like we i remember joan and i um once things got rolling and we had some comments like the first hour i was like hey this like was uh like we, we believed in it, but like, this is so validating to see the response from everybody. Um, no. And we have a, a huge thank you to you and all the other speakers that are showing up. Um, do you take anyone in part of those out and it starts to weaken, right? So big thank Yeah, I just looked at the well. lineup. I hadn't really gone to look at the lineup and I'm like, yeah. oh, <laughs> my goodness. I'm so <laughs> excited, yeah. <laughs> we I'm celebrate when we- get to talk. I'm happy I get to learn. Yeah, we, we get to celebrate every time we get a yes in those sort of uh, emails. I'm like, hey, will you speak? Here's the, you know, and it's it's super exciting. So thank you to everyone out there that's watching real quick. Um, what we're going to hear Kathy talk about is right here, talking about the cues. Um, and the event is live streamed as well as in person in Seattle, 19th, 20th, 21st. The stream is that Saturday and Sunday. Um, and Saturday, or sorry, Friday, the first day, will not be streaming, so there won't be live experience there, but we're going to do some fun in-person things um, at the event. So super excited. Um, to everybody out there, thank you for watching. Please hit the heart button. Show us those little hearts flying up on Facebook. It's super, <laughs> super reinforcing. And uh, if you don't mind sharing it as well for, with your communities, if that uh, makes sense for you, please do. It helps us kind of break through the algorithm that is Facebook. Um, and since we're not like clickbaity uh, negative content, let's get some more positive, positive work out there. So thank you so much, Kathy. You can stay on. Everybody Thanks, else. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. <laughs>